This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Right now, I'm sitting down with North Carolina Congressman Richard Hudson. How are you? Doing great. It's great to be here with you. Wonderful. Um, so, is this your first CPAC? Is this your 30th, 30th uh, CPAC? <laughs> it's the first time I've been invited to speak, so uh, very exciting for me. Uh, this is a, a you know a gathering of probably one of the biggest gatherings of conservative activists and students around the country. and So it's just exciting to be here and, and talk about an issue I care deeply about, the Second Amendment. Absolutely. So this is actually, this is something I wanted to ask you about. Um, there's, you know, across America, there's all sorts of different policies around gun control, around concealed carry laws, and so forth. And, you know, there's, there's these bizarre situations, I think one that you referenced, where you know people cross the state line and they're going to be subject to dramatically different rules. How do we deal with that in America? Well, we need a national reciprocity law, and that's why I introduced HR 38 last Congress, and again this Congress. You know, we're going to continue to work on it. Uh, but but you do have this hodgepodge of state laws, and uh, and and you know some some states have agreements with other states, but some states don't. And, and so what you end up with is uh, a person can become a criminal just because they've driven across an imaginary line. Uh, and, and sometimes they didn't even know they did. They didn't did. even know yeah. it. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, what I want to do is treat it like a driver's license. You know, I live in North Carolina. If I drive to D.C. to work, I don't have to stop at the Virginia state line and take a new driver's test to get a Virginia license. The state of Virginia recognizes that North Carolina license as a legitimate license. but. Having said that, I have to follow all the laws in Virginia, and as I pass through each municipality along the way, I have to follow their law. Um, and it's the same way with concealed carry. You know, if, if I'm in a different state, they ought to say, yes, he has a permit, but now you got to follow our laws. You know, New York State's got some very restrictive laws about the size of the magazine of a pistol and different things. You'd have to follow all those rules, um, or even restrictions on where you can carry. Um, you know, but but it's just it's just common sense. This is the reason you actually introduced HR 38. Absolutely. I wanted to, uh, to protect law-abiding citizens trying to exercise their rights, uh, keep them from becoming criminals. You know, the example I gave here at CPAC was Shanine Allen. She's a single mother, African-American, South Philly, who was actually a victim of, of an armed robbery twice. She worked at night, um, and so she went and legally purchased a handgun, got training on that weapon, and then went through the process and got a concealed carry permit. Later on, she's driving. She crosses the state line into New Jersey, routine traffic stop she was taught in her concealed carry class that when when you you know disclose. the officer comes disclose give them the permit with your license and she did said i'm a concealed carry permit holder i have a, a weapon in my purse well the police officer threw her on the hood slapped on the cuffs took her to jail she was looking at like 10 years in prison um, just because she'd crossed the imaginary line into a state that had a different set of rules but in this case uh she wasn't fitting the, the law in that state. So how, would, how does HR 38 account for that? How is this reciprocity agreement, how would it help her? In this well, case? the state of New Jersey didn't recognize concealed carry permits from the state of Pennsylvania. And so in this case, oh, I, okay, each state would have to recognize that right. that is a legal permit. Right. But, it, but if it were a situation where there were some restrictions around that, that her particular gun didn't meet, it would still be against them. That's right. And if, and if they, for instance, uh, the state of New Jersey had a law, I'm just making this up, but said, you know, you can't take a weapon into a restaurant. Well, if she went and did that, right. she would be breaking that law and this wouldn't cover. Of course. I mean, you've been, you know, a big, big supporter of Second Amendment rights and so forth. Um, maybe can you tell me a little bit about more about like what inspires you to do that? There's, I'll give you a little reason why I'm saying this. There are plenty of Americans who don't understand that, and, and I'd love to. I'm sure they'd love to know. Sure. Well, part of it is I'm a student of history. I love to read from a very young age, and, and I love history, and I love uh, reading about uh, you know about the founding of our country, and then I started reading about some of the folks who inspired our founders, and uh, and and the more I read and came to understand. Um, that, that what is fundamental to us as Americans is our right to defend ourselves is fundamental to our right to guarantee that we get to keep all our other freedoms. And so I understand uh, that you know, from once we came uh, that, that this right, this Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, our founders intended that to be the backstop to protect all our other rights. So, so it's very important from an intellectual standpoint. I also grew up uh, with a grandfather who, who was a big hunter. Uh, he had guns in every room of his house, uh, weren't, weren't locked, 
but I knew not to touch those guns. I knew to respect those guns, and I was raised to respect firearms. And at the appropriate age and in the appropriate times, I was taught to, to shoot, to target shoot, and to hunt, and to enjoy hunting as, a, as, a, as an endeavor. And so uh, I have a love for recreational shooting and hunting that, you know, when I'm in the woods today, I often think of my grandfather and some of the times we spent together. So, so for me, it's both as an intellectual exercise, understanding the importance of the, of the Constitution, but also, you know, I just, I love collecting guns. I love shooting guns. I love hunting. And so for me, it's kind of an all of the above. So people, I think it, it tends to be more folks in the cities, like in these very kind of dense urban areas, you know, like New York City, L.A., something like that. Who maybe uh, it's a very different situation than being in the, you know, in the heartland with a lot of space and opportunity to hunt. You know, you're not going to go hunting in uh, Central Park or something like that. Obviously, um, how does it is does the same rules apply to a place like New York City in your mind, or how how does that work? Well, when it comes to concealed carry, you mean well, well concealed carry and and in, and in general. You know, well, I, th I think it should. You know, I think. Yeah. You know, the Supreme Court has said there can be limits on the Second Amendment, so, you know, I'm not allowed to buy a bazooka or a tank or a fighter jet, and, I, you know, I'm fine with that. Um, and, and I do think, you know, uh, when it comes particularly to concealed carry, that, that municipalities and states ought to have the right to set restrictions as they see fit. So they might say, you know, can't, can't take a concealed carry gun into a place that serves liquor or whatever, you know, whatever rules they want to have or near a church or near a school or... Um, I, you know, I think municipalities and states ought to have the right to do that. And under my reciprocity legislation, they still can. And you have to honor those rules. You know, a lot of the, the naysayers and the folks that criticized my bill said, oh, there's going to be, you know, guns in Times Square and you're going to have all this violence everywhere. Um, it but, doesn't work I, like that. It doesn't, from yeah, it doesn't work like that. And, and actually, if you look at states that have adopted constitutional carry, which says by, by virtue of being a, a citizen, you can carry concealed in that state as long as you're not federally prohibited from doing so. Um, in those states that instituted that, so there's no background check, there's no class, that you can just carry, the crime went down. We didn't have these instances, these doomsday scenarios that the liberals paint where, you know, mass shootings and guns everywhere in the Wild West. Uh, empirically, it's now, I think, 30-some states. You just, you had a decrease in violence, not an increase. Fascinating. If you have, um, aside from the Second Amendment, push and so forth, what would you say is your you know, the biggest issue that you want to, that you're working for on behalf of your constituents? Well, veterans issues is really important to me. Um, I represent Fort Bragg, it's the largest right, army course. base in the world, yeah. and we have a whole lot of veterans who, uh, who choose to stay and live in, in the area. And so making sure that we keep the promises we've made to them is, is really important. I didn't serve, a lot of people in my family did. I see this now as my chance to serve, to take care of our veterans, to take care of our active duty folks. And so I take that very, very seriously. And, and you know, we've we've made some reforms to to veterans' health care. We got a lot of work still to do. So you're working on some bills in that in that vein? Absolutely. I want to. My my vision is that a veteran ought to have the choice to go to a private doctor or the VA, and we pay for it either way, right. and give them that flexibility. And what will happen is you'll actually see the VA improve health care because of the competition. Uh, but but in a lot of cases, you've got veterans who live a long distance from a VA facility, and it's a hardship to drive. Um, and, 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 and in some cases, you know, there's specialty type medicine that would be more appropriate to have in your local community uh, than to have the VA doing those things anyway. And so, so I'm going to continue to try to give flexibility to our veterans. We're not going to privatize the VA. I think you've got to keep that promise. You've got to keep that, that institution in place. But I think you need to add, give choices to our veterans. And if you had a message you wanted to share with uh with CPAC, the folks, or our audience, what would that be? That uh, get involved, uh, be involved civically, and be involved in the political process. Because uh, if the, the, if you don't get involved, if you don't have your voice heard, if you're not supporting candidates you believe in, there's someone out there supporting the other candidate, and, and their voice will be heard, and that we will get a government that other people want. So I would just say to conservatives and young people out there, get involved, stay involved. Uh, our, our This country's counting on you. The system with all its challenges, let's say, still works. It does, and, uh, and the system's only going to be as good as the people who participate in it. Wonderful. Well, it's such a pleasure speaking with you. I enjoyed it. Thank you.